0420 The entombment. Jefferson Ville in Genoa, you see. Blessed Heavenly Father, with the presence of the Holy Spirit already here, we approach the Holy Word. And although we have a bad voice trying to hold back and speak the word just as sure and steady as I can, I ask for divine guidance and the answer of the Holy Spirit to move among us tonight. And may He who is omnipresent, may He take the word of God and give it to every heart, just as we have need. May He feed us tonight with the good things of God. And tonight, while we are talking on the word, may our heart be many miles into Calvary, where Jesus paid all that sufficient price that was required of the great judgments of God from the Garden of Eden. And today we realize that we are freely justified by his resurrection and by his death, burial, and resurrection. And tonight we are so no longer of the world, for we have been bought with the price of the precious blood of the Son of God. And may we, with grateful hearts, turn to thee tonight with all the mind and strength that we have within us and serve thee with a pure and unrelated heart. Grant tonight, Father, if there would be some here that doesn't know you, the pardoning of their sins, and may they this night come humbly to the cross and there confess their sins to God that is just to forgive. And may this be a great night for all of us, for we ask it in the name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, we do realize that there is no one in the earth that is able sufficiently to take the word of God and reveal it, because the word is written by inspiration. The Holy Spirit is the author of the word. And when one was sought for in heaven to take the book and peruse the seals, there was found no one in heaven, nor in earth, nor beneath the earth, that was worthy to lose the seals or even to look upon the book. And there was a lamb, and that had been slain since the foundation of the world. And he came and took the book out of him that sat on the throne, throne and loosed the seals and opened the word. We are tonight believing and trusting in him that he will open the word for us. And now, as I read in second chapter of Acts, as I give out the first night, was the coming out. The second coming, and of the Lord Jesus, being Wednesday and Thursday night, was on the all-sufficient sacrifice, and Friday night was on the all-sufficient atonement, the perfect. Did you get it last night, the perfect? How can we be absolutely blameless and perfect in the sight of God, and tonight is the entombment, and tomorrow the resurrection? Just the follow days follow, and I have chosen tonight for my scripture reading out of the book of Acts, the second chapter, the 25th. 26 and 7 verses in Sposi, and it reads as this Peter speaking, David, for David speak concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore, in my heart rejoiced, in my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. What a beautiful text for this night. Or to get the context of him being in the tomb. The first thing we wish to look, draw your attention to, is the infallibility of God's word. God keeps his word to the letter, and tonight we want to fasten our thought on that, that God keeps his word. We can rest assured of anything that God has said in his word to be the truth, and faith does not rest upon the shifting sands of man's ideas or man's theology, but it has its final resting place on the unmovable rock of God's eternal word. The word, if God said it, that is forever the truth. He can never take it back and say, I do not mean it. I can say things, and you can say things. Then we are prone to have to take it back because we said it with our best knowledge and with the best of ability. But then God is so much different from us. He is infinite, therefore he does not say one thing unless it is absolutely perfect. He has... He never has to take it back, never has to apologize for what he said. It always sounds the truth. Even for Jesus in these great days that we are li- in celebration, when God really freed his son for the sins of the world of perhaps thousands of years before even the foundation was ever laid, God spoke the word since the finished product in heaven when God speaks it. It's already finished. Oh, if we could only grasp what that means, what different people would be to see in his book the judgment that is placed in here for the disobedient. It would make a man examine himself hour by hour, and it would make the righteous rejoice hour by hour to read the blessings that God has promised to the faithful. 
we can rest assured that every word will be fulfilled. Just anchor our soul on it. It's always been that way. When God spoke to Noah, way back in the antediluvian world, maybe perhaps before a Bible was ever written, or this Bible anyhow, was ever written, God told Noah there was coming a storm and the waters were going to cover the earth. And without one speck of evidence that it would happen, everything is very contrary. Noah moved his fear and built the ark, prepared it, for it was the saving of his household and himself. God let, never let him down because it was his word. He, it had to happen when God said it would happen. Now, when Job, the oldest book in the Bible, was written perhaps before Genesis was written, and it was included in the Bible, and Moses wrote to Genesis, Job, in his book, he rested solemnly upon the promise God made him, and he stood by his burnt offering without a fear in his heart, knowing that what God had said, God was able to perform. And when everything seemed to go contrary, Job stood firm because of God's promise was firm. God promised Job, and Job rested on that promise. Oh, if the church could ever get to that place where it can solemnly rest upon God's eternal word to be the truth, what a difference there would be. What a correcting there would be. What a cutting away there would be. What a joy there would be. What a power there would be when men and women would take God at face value. What he said is the truth, no matter what the circumstances look like. That has nothing to do with it. God said so, that settles it. The job, when he was in the most trying time of all his experience, when he had been found in the presence of God, a just man, even perfect, God said he was perfect. There was none like him on the earth, and Satan was given the privilege to tempt him, saying, I'll make him cast into your face. And he almost took Job's life and would have done it, but God would draw the boundary line and said, you can do nothing to him, but don't take his life. Then, when Job stood at the very tempting of the crucial moment, he said, I know my Redeemer liveth, and at the last days he'll stand on the earth, though the scheme ones destroy this body, yet in the flesh shall I see God. No matter how dark it seemed, and how unreal it seemed, there was something that Job anchored his soul on, God's eternal promise. Oh, if we could only do that. Notice he rested on the promise, I know my Redeemer liveth. And I want you to notice for future words I wish to say, Job specified his burying place. And when Job died, he was buried thus. There was another man by the name of Abraham who took God at his word, and he believed God, and he called those things which were contrary to the promise of God give him as though they were not. He took God at his word, and when the days passed by, and the weeks passed, and the months, and even the years passed, that never faced Job, Abraham one bit, the Bible said he staggered not through unbelief at the promise of God, but was faithful, giving praise unto God. When everything seemed true, every day it simply did grow more difficult every day. But instead of getting weaker, Job got stronger every day. Oh, what a blessed assurance we have when difficult seems to rise to make the thing that God has promised an impossibility. Instead of coming back, back into the world, we ought to stand the more firm than we ever stood on that say the Lord. It ought to settle it. When God says something, when Abraham called those things which were as though they were not, because they were contrary to the word, and when Abraham lost his sweetheart and wife Sarah, after many years living together, he bought a portion of ground near the place where Job was buried, and buried Sarah. Wonder why? They were prophets. They sinned. They contacted God, and now when Abraham died, he was buried with Sarah. Now, he did not want these fellows to give him that portion of ground. He bought it before witnesses. What a beautiful type of baptism. He bought it before witnesses, and it was his possession. Oh, that's the we, a real believer, ought to come, not slip off in the corner, but stand before the witnesses. I am a witness of the Lord Jesus and of the Holy Spirit and of his great works, and so much more as we see this evil day approaching. And then, when Abraham's son, which was Isaac, the promise was to be given him, and when Isaac died, he was buried with Abraham, and Isaac begot Jacob. And when Jacob was died, we were in Egypt, but notice, before he died, he said to the prophet's son, Joseph, come here, son, and put your hand upon my crippled hip. For remember how he was crippled is because the angel of the Lord touched his hip. 
and he limped from that day on. He said, Lay your hands on my hips and swear to me by the God of your fathers that you will not bury me down here in Egypt. Why? Oh, they had the word. They had the revelation. And we may stop here to see that the church of the living God is built upon divine revelation, not upon denomination or organizations, not upon creeds or doctrines, but on a spiritually revealed truth of the living God. Abel, in the Garden of Eden, when it ha- the church began, how did he know to bring a lamb? Why didn't he bring fruit like Cain did? But it was revealed to him. Jesus once speaking said, Who does man say, I, the son of man, am? Some said you are Moses and Elijah and so forth. He said, but who do you say I am? You see, it doesn't rest upon what somebody else thinks. It's what you know to be the truth. What do you say? That question would meet every one of us in a face tonight. What do you say? And Peter, quickly speaking up without one hesitation, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, a Jesus who knowed the secrets of all hearts, for he was none other than Jehovah manifested in flesh. He said, Blessed is thou, Simon, the son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven, has did this. And upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And we people, as we come on, and we want Lutheran to walk by faith, the Methodist wants to shout to get it, the Pentecostal wants to speak with tongues to get it, but it's 10 million miles away from it. It's a divine revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the person on his being made manifest in your heart upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It works perfect with Matthew 24, 5, 24, or St. John 5, 24. He that cherishes my words and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life, and shall never come into condemnation, but has passed from death unto life. Not because you had any move, any emotion, but because you have been in the privilege of having Christ revealed to you from heaven upon this rock, I'll build my church. And wh- then Jacob, when he died, his son and his body packed up, and he was buried with Abraham, Isaac, and Job in the Holy Hands of Palestine. And then Joseph, being a prophet, he prospered down in Egypt. He knew God. God had revealed himself to him. And when he died, he said, don't you bury my bones down here, but put, when somebody, God will surely visit you. Why? He rested solemnly upon the word of God through Moses, 400 years before they serve this mission. But, I'll bring them out. He rested solemnly upon the word. And what a beautiful illustration here, if you notice every Hebrew passing by with his back beat to pulp by slave drivers, and when he looked upon the bones of his prophet Joseph, he knew someday they were going out. So those bones are left there for a memorial that someday they would go out. It's been about 15 or 18 years ago when Billy Paul, the little boy, about 5 years old, hardly, so much he had a little flower, he was taken to his mommy's grave at daybreak one morning on Easter. Just as the sun was coming, peeping out just before daylight, it was then going to the service, and as he walked down to the grave, the little fellow took off his hat as we moved to where his little sister and his mother was buried. And he began to snub and cry and say, Daddy, is mommy down there in that hole? I said, no, son. She is not down there in that hole. She's a million times better off than you and I. He said, will I see mommy again? I said, by the grace of God, if you desire it, you can see her again. He said, will her body ever come up from the, this grave? I said, honey, close your eyes and I'll tell you a little story. Many hundred years ago this morning, there was a tomb left empty. I said, it's a memorial to those who sleep in God. Will Christ bring with him when he comes? Without a shadow of doubt, I rest solemnly upon God's eternal promise. As Job of old, when we hear that ashes to ashes and dust to dust, it reminds me of the Longfellow who said, tell me not in mournful numbers, life is just an empty dream. And the soul is dead that slumbers and things are not what they seem. He, they say, he said, yeah, life is real, life is honest. And the grave is not its goal, for dust thou art to dust returnest. It was not spoken of the soul. They call it a theophany. 
that when we leave here, we go into somewhere else, whatever it may be, I take the apostle's word when he said, if this earthly tabernacle or dwelling place be dissolved, we have one already waiting to move from this into that. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Job, all the prophets, they trusted and believed that there was a coming resurrection, that the Redeemer was coming and they prophesied of him. Enoch prophesied of him, rested solemnly with his testimony with it. Isaac, Jacob, Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they rested solemnly upon the time that the Messiah would come. And they died and their souls went into paradise. They could not go in the presence of God because we had it last night that the bulls, the blood of bulls and goats could not forgive sins. It only covered sins, speaking of a day when the perfect sacrifice for the blood in the animal could not come back to the worshipper. For then he would have not ceased to offer sacrifices of that type. But when the Son of God died, the life that was in him was none other but God to come back and adopt us into the family of God. And now we are children of God, his blood, the life from his blood. Now notice quickly, as we follow, when back in the Old Testament and those who believed and worshipped and died in the faith, waiting for that time, the reason those prophets did that and waited and wanted to be buried in Palestine, they knew that the resurrection was not going to be in Egypt. It was going to be in Palestine alone. That's why I say tonight I've got all kinds of names. I don't care what people call me. That doesn't mean a thing to me. The only thing that I want to do is know this, that I have been dead. My, my life is hid in Christ through God and sealed by the Holy Ghost. And when he comes from among the dead, I'll answer on that day, bury me in Christ and bury those that are in Christ will God bring with him on that day. How do we get in Christ? First Corinthians 12, 13. By one spirit, we are all baptized into one body and become fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. We profess to be pilgrims and strangers on this earth anymore, not seeking these worldly things, but looking for the coming of the blessed king to take over the domain from sea to upon the sea. When he comes in his glory, certainly we look for his coming. And then, no doubt in my mind, but that's what Jesus had in his mind when he was here on earth, was that infallibility of God's eternal word. For we know that in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The entire Godhead was in him. He was both Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but dwelt in a human form, the, the theophany of God, the great image of God, that he made man in, then placed him in the earth. He had a body. God isn't without a body. God has got a body. And it looks like a man. Moses saw it, the other saw it, and it looks like a man. And it's just an impression. This is of what that is. And everything on earth, the beauty, the sickness, the beauty of the earth, is nothing else in the world but an answer to a far better than that that waits for us when we leave this world. For everything in earth is just a fashion of that which is in heaven. Everything that's good, everything that's precious, everything that's beautiful, trees, birds, everything, is just a pattern of what is in heaven. Our own life is just a pattern. It's a shadow. Just a shadow and not a real thing. It's the negative side. It takes death to develop the picture, to put us back in the theophany we come from. Then in the resurrection, we come in his likeness as a resurrected body. What a beautiful, not only beautiful, but it is a real solemn truth of God's eternal word that will be like him. Notice, now Jesus invested with all the powers of God, but when he met Satan, he never used any of his powers. He only referred to the word. He did. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then, how can we see? You can see home and uh, just as good as a Christian as you would be a church. You can't do it. Read this word. The Holy Spirit feeds on the word. The Bible is God's spiritual diet for his church. And the Holy Spirit is the one who brings it to you and places it in the heart and with thanksgiving dewaters it. And every divine promise reproduces exactly what God said it would do. It's God to. It's his word and it's life. Now, I had forgot that I was just supposed to have a half hour. It takes me long to get to what I want to say. But notice Jesus, in the last hour or two of his life, many other prophecies was fulfilled. 
someone said to me, Brother Branham, this has to happen and that has to happen, which I said it would happen in an hour. If thou will read the second, second psalm and then watch his dying over the cross, I just forget now how many outstanding prophecies were fulfilled in the last two or three hours of his life. Certainly, they pierced my feet and my hands, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so forth, as David cried it. And then another thing I want to know, you to notice the truth, the infallible part of God's word. The Bible said, He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken, for in the type, the Paschal lamb was a type of it. The lamb must be without a blemish. No broken bones must be in the lamb, and that the hour when he was, he had died, and then went up to break his legs with a hammer. And just before, look at that very quick, quick, short moment. The man with the hammer ready to strike his legs, but God's word says there will not be one bone broke in his body. How is it going to happen? We got get in a hurry. God's word is eternal. If God's word is that perfect, them who are in Christ is just as sure to raise as there is resurrection. God is just as obligated to his word to heal you as he is to save you. For he, it's his word that promised it. It's God's word. And we have no right to take away from it, but just see it's the truth. Believe it no matter what happens. Believe it. Anyhow, that's the way we rest of them had to believe it. And we're not excluded from that. God gave Palestine to Israel, but they had to fight for every inch of ground they got. The promise is yours, but you have to fight for every inch you claim. The devil will see to that. Certainly he will. But notice, when they were ready to break the legs of our Lord Jesus, if that hammer would have struck the leg and broke it, God would have been found false. But there wasn't enough devils in all dark torment to let that hammer strike that precious body. For David, 800 years before then, said, There would not be one bone broke in his body. God's word has to stand truth. But what did they do then? They took a spear and rammed it in his side, and blood and water came out to fulfill what the Bible said. They pierced my hands at my side. The word was fulfilled. Now, when he was dying, oh, what a dreadful hour. I think for that long, and honest, it just makes me feel terrible. When I think of that song that the poet wrote many years ago, Mid rending rocks and darkened skies, my Savior bowed his head and died. He opened the veil, revealed the way to heaven's joys and endless day. And when he was hanging there, bleeding and dying, when he bowed his head and the sun got to, so ashamed of himself to look down upon mortal creatures who God had made in his image would have to pay such a price as that to redeem it, the sun refused to look down on the earth. In that hour, the moon was so embarrassed, he withdrew his place, and the stars turned their back to the earth. What a horrible thing sin must be, how God had to deal with it. And to see those mocking priests with feet hanging in his face, a man hit him on the head with a reed said, If you are a prophet, tell us who hit you. One of them pulled his beard from his face and smacked him on the face and wanted himself him to take up to himself. He said, if my kingdom was of this world, I would straight away call my father. He would send me angels, legions, twelve legions of angels. It could have been changed. But how could he do it? He just couldn't do it, for it was his own children crying out for his blood. Certainly, you imagine a daddy, a father, with his own child, ran in darkness, crying out for their own father's blood. That's the reason he could do nothing else but die. If he didn't, it was doomed for his children, it was doomed for all the creatures, but he had to die to save his people. And when he did, when he bowed his head, this old earth had a shiver run over its back. It must have had a nervous prostration, for the Bible said that the whole earth from the sixth to the ninth hour was dark, was over the whole face of the earth. And the earth shook and the rocks rent, and the temple veil tore from the top to the bottom, the sacrificed blocks turned over, the son of the living God died. He was so dead until the sun recognized it. He was so dead till the moon recognized it. He was so dead till the stars recognized it. He was so dead till the earth recognized it. He was so dead till all the elements recognized it. The 
that once he has recognized it, everything had to know that the Son of God, for God's word could not fail. He promised, he was promised from the Garden of Eden, the seed that would bruise the serpent's head. Now what happened to him? Where did he go? When he left the cross of, and went in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, he was so poor he had not a place to lay his head. He was born in a manger with a black name behind him. As an illegitimate child, he was laughed at, made fun of, scoffed at. In the earth, he was made fun of and rejected, and when he died, he had to die through capital punishment between two thieves. He did not even have a place to bury him, and he was buried in another man's grave, the very God of heaven coming to earth. Who do we think we are, but have to go through a little bit of suffering? What he did for us, think of it, friends, study it. Of it, the Roman soldier said, "Truly, that's the Son of God." The sinner had to recognize it. Judas said, "I betrayed innocent blood." He had to recognize it. The whole earth to recognize it. Then where did he go? When a man dies, does that finish it? No, sir. He had to die that way because God's Bible said that he would die that way. That he trusted God's word. That's the reason he could say, "In his life, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days." For David said, one place, only in the Bible under the inspiration, when David, the man of God, the prophet that was anointed with the word, said, I will not suffer my holy one to see corruption, neither will I leave his soul in hell. Jesus said, you destroy this body, and I'll raise it up in three days. He knew that God's word could not fail. Oh my, if he could rest solemnly upon that, believing that God's word could not fail, how much more can we rest as solemnly that we have been born again by the Holy Ghost, and it is a witness in our hearts right now that we know that our Redeemer lives and he will come again someday. Rest assured that those that are in Christ will God bring with him. Now notice, there he was. He knew that not one cell of that body would corrupt. 72 hours crossed from 17. That's the reason he never stayed. Three days he died on Friday, was up Sunday morning, but it was then three days. Within those three days, he was raised again because he trusted God's word. Here he goes, where did he live when he left? The Bible said he ascended. He went and preached to the souls that were in prison, that repented not in the long suffering of the days of Noah. His soul, his spirit, his theophany of his own being went down. Let's follow him. Would you like tonight to follow him a few minutes? Let's see where he went. Just below the regions of mortal beings lays a realm of demon power. Below that, just above that, lays the soul of the unjust. Below it lays the very domain, domain of Satan, hell. Then just above us lays the Holy Spirit. Then under the altar lays the soul of the just man. The next is God himself. One going downward, one going upward. The two spirits are here on earth, influencing the people of this earth. And when Jesus died, he goes up down there. I can see him on that Friday afternoon after his death. Brother Abraham knocks on the pulpit, knocks on the door of the regions of the lost. Let's follow him a minute. The door opens. There was women. There was men. There were young ladies. They were old. They were all together in that hideous place called the prison of the lost souls. If I had time, I'd like to tell you, and it might be just a vision, but one time I visited that place and screamed for mercy when I was a sinner going under operation. When I come out, I was standing in the west with my hands up towards the heaven and a cross shining on me. But in that mournful place there, Jesus walked to the door. Everything had to witness that he was the Son of God because they had been preached to in the days, in the long suffering of the days of Noah. Knocked at that door, he said, I am who Enoch spoke of, and he, the seed of the woman that was to bruise the serpent's head. Every word of God has been fulfilled. I've just died beyond at Calvary, and I've purchased my church, and the only one that Enoch spoke of, I am he. And they was without mercy, without hope, because they had transgressed, and the door was shut in their face. On down into the regions of demons, on down to the very gates of hell, he knocked at the door, but the Abraham knocks on the pulpit. This is when he was in the tomb. His body is waiting for the resurrection. He visited the places that the just and the unjust goes, where we will go one of these days to, and on the other places. And he knocked at the door of hell, but the brother knocks on the pulpit. Amen. When he did, the devil come out. And I can hear him say, Oh, so finally you have arrived. I'm sure I heard you when I killed Abel. You see, when that seed 
was promised in the Garden of Eden, the devil has constantly tried to destroy that seed. And the death of the Abel was the coming of Seth, was a, just a death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, the seed must continue and he tried to destroy it. He said, I thought I had you when I destroyed Abel. I thought I had you when I destroyed the prophets. I was positive I had you when I beheaded John. But now after all you have arrived, I've got you now. Oh my. I can hear him say, Satan, come here. He's a boss now. Reaches over, grabs the keys of death and hell off the side. Hang it on his own side. I want to serve notice on you. You have been a black long enough. I am the virgin born son of God, the living God. My blood is still wet on the cross and the debt the full debt is paid. You have no rights no more. You are stripped. Give me those keys. That's right. Turns around and gives him a good healthy kick and slams the door together and say, Stay in there, I'm the boss from now on. Now, he didn't have the keys to the kingdom because he gave them to Peter. We get all that in the morning in water baptism, but he had the keys of death and hell and took them. After his resurrection, he said, I got the keys of death and hell. Peter had the keys of the kingdom. Satan had the keys of death and hell, but now Jesus has got them, his boss. Here he starts up, it's getting Easter, time is passing fast, but there is another group. Where is Job? Where is Abraham? Where are they at? Where is those fellows that trusted God's word? Has he forgotten them? Did death annihilate them? Was that all of it? Never, never, God has to keep his word. I can see him, let's take a little trip into paradise and look over there. And I see Sarah and Abraham walking around there. And after a while, speaking on the door, Abraham goes and opens the door. Said, honey, come here. Look here, look here. That's the very same one that stood with me under the oak here today. He's Abraham's God. Just then I can see Daniel look over his shoulder and say, That's the rock that was hewed out of the mountain. That's as certain as I'm standing here. I see Job raise up, said, That's my redeemer. That I said, I know that he lived. And someday he would stand upon the earth. My body may not be but a little spoonful of ashes, but in 15 minutes from now, I'll be in it again. That's him. Ezekiel looked over the top and said, I've seen that same person as a wheel in the middle of a wheel turning that way, way up in the middle of the air. Oh my. Then when Enoch, then up comes Enoch. Enoch said, I saw him coming with ten thousands of his sins to execute judgment. There was the Old Testament saints waiting. Sure, they was waiting under the torment of blood. They could not go in the presence of God, God of heaven. Because goat and sheep blood could not take away sin. But he said, My brethren, I am the one that you think I am. I am the seed of the woman. I am the son of David. I am the son of God. I am the virgin born one. My blood has atoned for it. You waited under the blood of sheep and goats, but now my blood atones and you are free. Let's go up. We promised Easter. I just think that was just about 1900 and something years ago tonight. I can hear Abraham say, Lord, when we get up in our bodies again, and Sarah and I just loved it so well, do you mind if we make a little stop kind of on a, the road? Well, I can hear him say, why? No, certainly not. I'm going to stay with my disciples for about 40 days, look around and see how everything looks on that glorious Easter morning when we'll take up in the morning, the Lord willing, when he rose from the dead, the Bible said, according to St. Matthew, that many of the saints that slept in the dust of the earth rose and come out of the grave. Who was it? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job. Those who, by spiritual revealed revelation, know that the Redeemer would stand on the earth someday. Thus then, the first fruits of those that slept, there they walked in the city. I can see Sarah and Abraham, young and full of the handsome and full life, full of life, never to be old no more, never to be sick no more never to be hungry no more, walking around in their body. Hayafa standing there saying, you know what, there was something happened the other day, just look at this mess this temple is in. There is, we are going to have to get someone to sew that pattern up, look at those sacrifice box turn over. What happened? Was that guy an astrologer? Was he a witch? Or what happened to him? See, come here, Josephus. Who is that young couple standing there? Abraham said, Sarah, we have recognized we better get out. Appeared to many, that wasn't all of it. 
in closing what one day when after he had they had visit abraham isaac and jacob and all of them had visited the homeland when jesus ascended up he said brother branham is that mythical no sir i'll show you in the scriptures in a minute when he began to go up they only seen him but the old testament saints went with him for the bible said that he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men and i can see him as he goes up and joins with his church two angels out of the band that were playing the music come back there hey you men of Galilee why stand looking up for this same Jesus that was taken up is coming again certainly they hurried back to join the procession and down through the skies Jesus and the Old Testament saints went they passed the moon they passed the sun they passed the stars and when they got in sight of that great beautiful white heaven the Old Testament saints streamed out quoting scripture Lift up your everlasting gates and be lifted up. Lift up your everlasting gates and be lifted up. And the King of Glory coming. All the angels gathered up on the top of the banisters of heaven and said, Who is this King of Glory? The Old Testament said, Saint said, The Lord of hosts, mighty in battle, who is the conqueror. The angel pressed the big button and the pearly gates swung open. Right down through the city of Jerusalem, come. The great mighty conqueror bringing the Old Testament saints. The angelic bands are playing as the angels are shouting. He was the great mighty conqueror. He had the keys of death and hell hanging on his side, going right down as past the palaces of glory till he got to the throne. And he said, Father, have they? Here they are. They believe in faith and your word. And I would come someday. I have conquered both death and hell. What was it, brother? He had the scars in his hand to show that he's been in the battle. Glory to God in the highest. He is that mighty conqueror. Here they are, Father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I can hear him say, Son, climb up here by my side and sit down until I make your every enemy your footstool. Brother, someday he will come again, and what a day it will be. He wasn't idle when he was in the tomb. We think he was just laying there dead. But he was still conquering. He went down and took the keys away from Satan. He's got the keys of both death and hell tonight. He said, because I live, you can live also. I wonder tonight, my dear brother, sister, have you thought that over sincerely? Do you realize that you only live because he lives? Have you appreciated it enough to offer up yourself and say, God, here I am, a sinner, be merciful to me? Have you ever accepted that all-sufficient sacrifice? Have you ever told him you loved him? Does it uh, hurt your feelings when you do wrong? If you've never come to that experience, now in this entombment, when our time is getting away, that's still fine. But I'm wondering if you have and received Christ as your personal Savior, I wonder if you would do it while you bow our heads just a moment in a word of prayer. Play that mid rending rock with your sister Gertie if you have it. All right, anything will do with your heads bowed. I'm going to ask you a real sincere question. Remember, friends, sin or saint, you're not out of existence when we bury you. Your soul is somewhere. Now, Jesus visited both places according to the scriptures. Where would he find you if you would go tonight? Would you have the door of mercy shut on your face because you're rejected? Remember, not only is he a savior, he's a judge. You are the judge now. How do you judge him? Let him be a savior now. A little story comes to my mind. Some time ago, a little boy was sitting in a wagon. A gun fired down the street and the horses ran away. He was going over a cliff. A young cowboy ran and stopped the horses just before the wagon went over the cliff because it had a baby in it. He saved the little baby's life many years after that. Standing in the courthouse, this same boy had done a crime, took the road that's guilty, that's wrong, been guilty, he was drinking, gambling, shot a man and was found guilty. And the judge raised up and said, I sentence you to hang by your neck until your life is gone. That young man said, Judge, as he broke the court procession, as he jumped over the rail and fell at the judge's feet for mercy, he said, Judge, look at my face. Don't you know me? He said, No, son, I don't. He said, You remember a certain little boy's life that you saved many years ago? From a runaway horse, he said, yes, I remember it. 
he said i am that boy he said judge you saved me then save me now the judge looked down at him and said son that day i was your savior today i'm your judge today he's your savior to see that tomorrow he may be your judge let's think it over now as the music plays and everyone's praying those who are on praying ground with god i wonder tonight how uh, now quickly those that would like to accept christ as personal savior say god is merciful to me a sinner i want to come by the shed blood i'm tired of joining churches and running from place to place I want to be born again. I want an experience in my heart that I know that Christ has revealed himself to me by the spiritual revelation that you just spoke of, Brother Branham. I want the spiritual revelation, the Holy Spirit in my heart, making me alive, bringing Christ more real to me than I am to myself. I desire that experience, Brother Branham. Will you pray for me as I raise my hand? Will you raise your hand now? Who desires to be remembered? God bless you, lady. God bless you back there, lady. That's good. God bless you, sir. That's good. Raise your hand. Now go uh, on up with your hand. How would you be shameful? Would you reject such as our friend? Remember, oh, you say, Brother Branham, preachers has preached for years. I know that one of these days they're going to cease preaching. And the thing, the way things look, it might be right away. You're going to hear your last sermon. Frankly, this may be your last. Oh, you say, I'm young. That doesn't matter. God is no respect of person or age or ability. Will you now accept him as your personal savior by raising your hand and saying, God be merciful to me. Raise your hands with the rest of these and say, now I want to accept Christ. Would you raise up your hand? Some would just backslid and say, God be merciful to me. I want to come back to Christ this night. That tomorrow night may be a resurrection new for me. Would you raise up your hands, bring up your hand, say, be merciful to me. I want to now come. Will you do it? Raise up your hand and say, I've been a backslider for tonight. God bless you, lady. God bless you. That's good. I will accept Christ as a personal savior. I will accept him tonight. I've wandered many years away from God, but now I'm coming home. Will you accept him tonight? That this may be a new resurrection for you. Your old life should be finished. This lady is coming up to the altar to make a confession, to stand. Somebody else wants to take their place here. Come up here with her and their confession. Would you stand up and come up to the altar too? The altar is open. Certainly come right on up right now. If you want to stand here and pray, it will just be all right. Come on. Will you come upon your confession and your faith, upon your belief in the Son of God? Will you now come? All right. It's up to you. You remember, you're the one. Are you a sinner? Are you a backslider? Are you cold and away from Christ? And you want to be raised anew with him now. Start life anew. How about your husband and wife that's been out for a long time, first being in your home? Won't you come and straighten that thing up with God and each other now? Make Easter really an Easter for you. Start a new home. What's about you that's never been, has never had prayer in your home? You just go home to uh, from church and try to do the best you can never bring the family together and pray that's why we've got so many ju juvenile delinquency and things we've got that's why the american homes are broke up once you start start anew tonight will you do it you invited remember i'm your minister now that i'll be a witness on that day we bow our heads bowed and now for prayer our blessed heavenly father tonight we bring thee this audience in the most solemn sacred solemnity that you know how we humbly approach thy throne and after the message tonight that that great improvement he never laid silent his soul went right on into the regions and the works of god that he was ordained to do and tomorrow morning we find where he went through the realms above conquering everything in his resurrection but he come out on easter morning for our justification and we find that he sent the holy back to convict men of sin and we pray tonight lord that those who raise their hands may be remembered before thee may their decision be from their heart tonight that they have received you and believe you and may they be sealed away by the seal of promise tonight the holy spirit grant it father for we commit them unto thee with this message tonight may it bless those who had it lord those lord who will take it and with them to their home and sink it deep in their hearts 
May they live on the word of God. Grant it, Father. For you ask in Christ's name. Amen.